without any further introduction, I wanted to like to start talking about the topic of today, score reading. The process of learning a score or reading a score seems to be a little bit complicated, but let me just show you briefly how this works in the history or how we, we just evolved to having this score. So as you notice, we, do, we did have the different lines and the idea was just to show where to go most likely. You're going up, you're going down. Um, the clef itself wasn't developed so much. So this is one of the oldest um, printed music we got from um, the 13th century. Um, so it's it's a it's a beautiful uh, round uh, called uh, Sumer Il Sumer Kuminin or the summer is here something like that and actually it applies for us because uh, summer is around the corner and as you notice it's just like a guidelines but it's not so much information and of course every note is linked or connected with a syllable it evolves to Bach for instance this is a cup that's this is a couple of centuries later we get uh, in the Baroque period more instruments, we already have the different clefs. So the treble clef for violins or flutes, the alto clef for viola, for instance, or a bass clef for bass clef for basses, cellos, bassoons, or any other instruments. And just the only idea is to make sure that when you're reading music, you get the right range. So if you play a bass, you don't have to be leading with a lot of additional lines because if we only play all in treble clef, most likely we're going to get a lot of different lines underneath for basses. And, and uh, if you are only reading on a bass clef, for instance here, and you play a piccolo, you're going to get tons of different additional notes, uh, lines on top. So this is Bach, for instance, and it's becoming more complex. It's more complex, so a lot of instruments, um, different um, keys, because some of those instruments will be uh, transposed, meaning uh, B flat clarinet, when you play a C, you don't get a C, but you actually you have to go to the piano and you actually get a B flat. So that's why the music that you see in the score, it's just everything is one uh, whole step up. And that works with all different instruments that we need to transpose, such as horns, trumpets, and many others. So this is Baroque, this is Bach. Fantastic uh, concerto, the Brandenburg concerto number three. After Bach, we got this beautiful score. And that beautiful score and had lots of different mistakes like this. So the composer thought flutes, really? I think I don't need them. So he cut it. He just crossed them out because he realized that was a mistake of what the message he wanted to show. So that's why he embraced his mistakes, great friend, who actually we will be playing lots of different music today. Beethoven, this is the music. So that's basically what he called, was like the destiny was calling to his door, something like this. That's why we call the symphony of the, of the destiny, just because of those four notes. And he composed a whole symphony out of those four notes. Uh, and then we get uh, Brahms, more complex, more instruments, and then we have uh, Brahms with many other instruments. As you notice, we have strings, one choir, two choirs, uh, soloists, then an organ, then a percussion, then brass, then woodwinds, but not one or two bassoons, but actually four bassoons. So this is just my life. I will not just show you the whole spectrum of scores. I want to just use a, a great friend um, to show you how the, it works in his Beethoven. So Beethoven has been my friend for many years. Uh, as, as, an, as an anecdote, I want to just share something that you might not even believe. When I was a kid, I was raised a couple of years by uh, my uncle, a Czech uncle, he come from the, came from the Czech Republic after the Second World War. My parents got divorced at that, at that point, so I was living with them for a couple of for some time. And he was a fantastic musician, professor at the university, bass player, fantastic. And he always said, Beethoven is too simple. You should just listen to something else. Beethoven, he just had simple rhythms, really basic harmonies. He had this conversation for many years and, and, and I was able to talk to him a year later when I went to college. And he said, like, yeah, I just want, he wanted to push me to understand the really uh, meaning of Beethoven. 
And I actually, at this point, I'm so excited to say that Beethoven has become my friend for many years because I, every day I just find something new about Beethoven. So in score reading, I'm gonna just get back to my scores. I'm gonna just show you how this works for the different instruments that Beethoven actually um, composed. Here we go. When we are reading a score, this is a score for only one instrument. And it's the same way I just read this one or if I'm just reading over the, Symphony number no. eight by Mahler that I just showed you, uh, that is actually called the Symphony for the, the 1000 because it's called 1000 performers. So this one is only calling one, but the process is exactly the same. I start reading scores from the very top. So Klaviostik begins piece for piano in German. In Amol in A minor. Composer. Oh, Für Elise. Um, uh, for, for Elise on the 27th of April, 1810. So it gives me so many different ideas before I just even play one note. So when we are treating the score again, it's the same if the score is just for flute and piano, or it's a string quartet, it's an opera, or it's a symphony of thousand performers as the matter said, eight, matter eight, it's exactly the same. It's just reading the score. So for Elise, for Elise, it's really easy to understand that he was just dedicating this to somebody who he deeply loved. And uh, as an anecdote of this piece, actually, it was not for Elise, it was for Therese. But he didn't want to reveal the name of her because he was, he was in love on that Therese. So he, he would say for Therese, um, first of all, it sounds kind of different um, in the first place. But second, he didn't want to just show that girl that he was really deeply in love. So that's a little anecdote about the piece, but it's exactly the same as I just said. Composer, what information I get, because we are messengers from the composer to the audience. So we need to, first of all, before I check this, before I check um, this, I need to check this. And I spent sometimes many hours researching composer they did. So his or her lifetime, everything. Then we go to the different clefs and the, the, the time signature and the key signature. And then we can just start reading the music, but it, that's not the book. So the next one, it's for instance, another piece by Beethoven. And I, I start listening, I start reading here, Overture to, uh, so to, to Opera Leonore, meaning Overture Opera of Leonore. So this is a really good example why we should read always first here, then here. The, these lots of dots and lines really don't tell you anything without this context. Even without this word, little word, Fidelio. The reason is because um, we know right now that the opera is uh, the opera name is Fidelio, but actually he was always uh, saying Leonore was probably the most important character of the opera. And at some point he thought to call this opera Leonore. And also because actually this score has so many instruments. I'm gonna just jump into the next one, but before I wanna just to show you how a score for conductors work. We have woodwinds on top. Flauti, the difference between flauti and flauto is that flauto would be only one flute. But flauti means we have two flutes, then two oboes, two clarinets in C. So we don't have to transpose them. Bassoons, horns, two sets of horns, two, two horns in C, two horns in E, two trumpets, timpani, trombones, and we have three kinds of trombones, trombone alto, tenor, and bass, and then the strings. So this is an, an opera. Is, so if we go, to, for instance, to a quartet, string quartet, it's exactly the same thing. Okay, you see here, dry quartet, meaning three quartets. So that tells you that it's not, he didn't compose this as a single quartet, but he had in mind three of them when he started composing. Of course, because um, Rasumovsky, who commissioned him this piece, he said, may I have three quartets? So all three quartets called the Rasumovsky quartets, of course. Uh, so the, they are connected because they were all three uh, composed for him. And actually, Rasmoski himself played in the string quartet that actually uh, played this uh, piece for the first time. But it's exactly the same thing. So uh, who, did, he, who was commissioning this piece? Um, then composer, what instruments? And then you go into, into the 
posizione, meaning we have something afterwards, introduction to something else. I'm not going into that yet. So, and we have also Beethoven sometimes uh, writing so great things that actually help you understand the music before. So we find here, symphony number six in F major, opus 68, Pastoral. It means we have more than, we have five symphonies before. You might say it's obvious, but if you are so reading a score for the first time and it says symphony number six, or it says quartet number four, or it says trio number two, please check what the composer wrote before that. So if I'm learning this score from the Pastoral Symphony by Beethoven, I should go and learn and at least listen to the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth symphonies to understand how he came up with that sixth symphony because it's not isolated. It's completely a result of this evolution of his writing. And in this one, he even make it really easy. So, Sene and Bach, meaning the scene at the creek. So, oh, creek, how about this is water? So that's the, the water that we are listening there. And then we have a beautiful melody, but it's quite easy. Again, I, I haven't even read everything, but I know this title, I know this needs to be soft, it needs to be legato, it needs to be, because it's a creek that is going, it's not a river, it's not an ocean, it's not a waterfall, it's just a creek. Okay, so, and even later, even he made it even easier for us. Look at this, the flute. Meaning that's a bird. What kind of bird? It's a nightingale. I mean, a, a nightingale. Oh, it's in English, nightingale. Uh, and then we have bucktail. This one. Uh, and we have cuckoo. So different birds and how they sound. It's really easy. As you notice, so this word of uh, reading a score is great because we are able to um, learn the the rationale behind the composer's ideas and the composer's music. That's why we look always at the top, the title, composer. How many pieces he wrote before that? What is the context of that? He wrote a, a, an animal name, like a sort of animal, then you have to replicate that. So that's really easy in this case, but sometimes you get only a level, just that. So that's where you have to definitely go into the music and start finding out what he, the composer wanted. So that's why I just wanted to use one of his great pieces, like two great pieces by Beethoven, uh, this scoring uh, process for you to learn how conductors, musicians, and everyone dealing with uh, printed music have to deal on taking that message from a composer and translating it into something that could be heard but by an audience and understood, like, oh, I know what he meant. So um, let me just go again to show you two beautiful pieces by my friend Beto. So this is a really famous symphony that you, I just played a little bit from for you. I will just be going to. The whole symphony will be just about four notes. And this, the, the, the one we're looking at, it's the third movement. Those are the four notes, but check what happens right here. So we have this, and instead of going here, it's envisioning a new world, something really positive. So it would not the bad end that we were thinking when we started having symphony. Check this. such a beautiful place is because he's looking for this. So why 
I just wanted to point this out because as much as you think, okay, compose or conductors are just learning each note, how, what, what instrument is playing, but actually we are also learning and most of the time is finding why composers wrote those notes. So I'm really interested to hear why he moved from this G to this A flat. The reason it's around the corner, because as, as I just showed you, he's just preparing this beautiful E natural that is going, is taking us to C major. And that's the fourth movement, a big celebration of never mind. I thought they were the call of the destiny, like the destiny is calling me because this is the end of my life. And that's why he went to a beautiful place called Heiligenstadt, a beautiful uh, village uh, close to Vienna in Austria. And he found these creeks, these birds. And then he said, you know what? Life is great. <laughs> so then that's why the end, the very last movement, it's in C major as a B celebration. So that's in short, I want, just want to point out how much composers just use this printed music to deliver messages. And that's why when you're, when you're uh, reading a score, don't just read the rhythms, don't just read the notes. Actually, you have to go way deeper. You have to find what the message of the composer is. And that takes time. Of course, you need to play the music in your instrument to, to be able to understand what that message is. You have to also research and do things we have internet. So when I was uh, a kid, we didn't have internet, by the way. We got uh, libraries and, and, and it, would, it took us quite a long time to find out why Rasumovsky wrote three string quartets. Uh, so Beethoven wrote uh, three quartets for Rasumovsky and not two. And, not, and, and then you have to just go deeper and deeper in the history and say, oh, that's why. Oh, and he didn't play in the, in the quartet. So those things just give you a different approach. This is my last part of the score reading. So I'm gonna just show you the real, so real time process of reading the score after you, uh, after I just mentioned it, how important it is just to understand the reasoning, the rationale behind the notes. And we just go directly into how to read a score. I'm gonna use the first symphony because it's in C major. All instruments are in C. You don't have to transpose anything at all. So I'm gonna just, spend the next 10 minutes, maybe less, showing you how to read a score. So I'm, I'm kind of like pretending because I know the score already, but let's say this is for some of you, probably for most of you, it's gonna be the first time looking at this score. So let's pretend you all became conductors. It's everything is in C major. So let's pretend, I'm pretending because I know this score really well. This is all in C. So the way we're gonna read this is we're gonna start, um, you can start from the top and the bottom, it's just the same, but you have to understand that the higher you are, the higher pitch you get. So of course we get the piccolo on top and we go just to the very bottom, we have the bass, the double basses. So in, it's divided also by different sections. So we have strings. If we would have any singers, they might be in between the brass and the strings, but right now we have no singers. We have some brass and we have a timpani right here. So there are certain composers that we prefer to write the percussion in between, or it depends just on every composer. Then we have the rest of the brass, and then we have the woodwinds. And each section itself is just, again, from the bottom, from the lo lowest pitch to the highest pitch. So this is the woodwinds. The first one at the bottom is the um, contra bassoon, bassoon, and if you have the letter E, fagotti means you have two of those, or clarinetti, you have two clarinets for two oboes or two flutes. So this is how we work by section. The next section, we go this. Great. You have trombones at the bottom. Those are the lowest, lowest pitch. And you notice we have also the three of them listed in that order. And then we have the strings exactly the same. Double basses, cello, as well as violins. So it's quite simple. If you if you actually start to look at the score, I would recommend the way I started is just by using one section. So don't try to see this picture at once because it might be just like confusing. You can start, not to me, I mean, for conductors, we develop this kind of um, uh, way to read music that you take a picture and you just process everything and you know how, for instance, this uh, the contrabassoon will be pretty the same as double basses 
and cheros will be sometimes close to bassoons in this period. Like, look at this, this is just different. And horns and trumpet will be similar in this period. So it doesn't apply for Mahler. It doesn't apply for other composers. But right now, in uh, so right here in Beethoven, it does apply. So <clears throat> if you just take one of them, and you feel more uh, familiar with string, let's say you play viola, start with this. So kind of like omit this whole big picture. Start just <clears throat> focusing your uh, attention on here. I totally recommend to just try to look at the top and the bottom. And the one in between, which will be second violins and violas, you get that. It's, it's unbelievable how much you can process information at once. But focus on this one and this one, and you're going to get the whole picture. So that's, and you just start, and then you start going by sections. I only work with the with the woodwinds. Do the same thing and then with the brass. Something important about the scores is that when you see the different claps, you might be familiar for, with one of them. If you play cello, this is really good for you. But alto clef, what's that? Or if you play violin. So it's really good when you're just reading scores to start thinking that it's just a range. That's, that's why we have to change the different um, claps. It's the only reason. So that's pretty much what we need to do. And if you see this, you start doing something like that. So you just go to the piano. <clears throat> this is what I'm looking at. So we have the basses, the songs, uh playing something like this. <laughs> You have, for instance, the clarinets, and you guys have also the oboes uh, with something like this. But you also get, for instance, the, uh, be the viola, which is really important. They are the only ones doing this. So we have all so many. are really important are the only ones that are keeping this. If we wouldn't have them, that would be a completely different story. So that's why uh, I keep telling my friends that uh, every instrument has a reason, a meaning, and uh, in the whole spectrum of the, of the orchestra. 